Today's uh, discussion is about spirit communication. And uh, before I begin the actual formal discussion, I wanted to just say that there are lots and lots of very excited spirits uh, here today. And one of the reasons why they're very excited is that they feel that through the information that, that we'll be talking about today, many of you may finish up becoming mediums in, the pro in this process and be more open to talking with your spirit friends. And so that uh, brings them a lot of excitement because one of the big frustrations of a spirit, particularly if you're not yet at one with God, is that you'd like to talk about your experiences a lot with people on earth, but nobody seems to want to listen to you. So that's something that uh, many of the spirits who are here today are really looking forward to knowing more about communication. I'm going to do something a little different with the questions during the next hour or so, the next couple of hours. And that is, I only want a question asked if it actually came from a spirit. So those of you who are actually mediums here today, if you, if you hear a question from a spirit, if you can put up your hand about related to the material that we're discussing, and uh, I'll certainly love to hear the question from the spirit and we'll talk about that. The reason why I want to do that is that there are some of the lowest sphere spirits here today who want to ask questions as well and uh, want to know what's going on in their area in the spirit world and how it relates to what's going on here on earth. Of course the higher spirits, the ones especially in the celestial spheres, they, uh, they obviously know what's going on completely pretty much. There are however spirits in the sixth sphere also who have some questions that they would like to ask and so I'm sure today throughout our discussion those of you who are already mediums can pop their hand up and ask those questions. Um, the second half of the discussion today will be a more informal part of the discussion and what I'm going to do is get all of those who actually um, do communicate with spirits and are aware of the communication occurring and also can obviously either hear words or sense things quite easily. If you could sit around the front area, so we'll just have to reorganise the seating a little for this to occur, and, um, and if, if we can focus on the questions that you have in that session as well. Because uh, my goals for doing this session are actually many fold. One of the goals for doing this session is that I would like to actually eventually end up with uh, quite a number of people who are very good mediums who are on the divine love path who can connect with divine love spirits and that then a lot of truths can be uh, can come from the spirit world through those mediums to you and we can start looking at even publishing those and printing those uh, messages out as a as a um, if you like, as a book or a, or a, a heap of a, a resource of messages that can be used to help people through their emotional condition. The other thing that we'd like to do in this process is to, if, if mediums have more clarity, what we can start doing is teaching spirits. And one of the biggest problems that, a, that faces a celestial spirit is that it's very, very difficult for them to connect emotionally to a person in the first to sixth spheres uh, due to lots and lots of emotions that exist in those persons in the first to sixth spheres. And so they find actually, the celestial spirit usually finds a lot more assistance um, if somebody on earth can help those spirits and, and then get at least a connection or a communication going between those spirits and the celestial spirits. So we could actually finish up helping large groups of spirits in the spirit world moving from the first sphere onward to other spheres in the spirit world. Now that obviously has a flow on effect onto the earth. Because the flow on effect on the earth is that many spirits in the first sphere are heavily earth bound or very interested in what's going on on earth and they highly influence what's happening on the earth. And so if these spirits uh, could actually move into newer conditions and, and more happy conditions they would be less, fre less frequently influencing people on earth in a negative way. And that has a very, very powerful effect on the earth. So um, I've actually at some, st at some stages spoken to fifth groups of 50,000 to 100,000 spirits at once. 
And of those 50 to 100,000 spirits, often 80 or 90 percent of them get on the divine path from that one discussion. So that's how effective it can be in the spirit world to actually help people get onto a, another path of progression and actually help them actually experience more bliss. You see, here on earth, the problem we have often is that we're not easily convinced, are we? And because we are in the spirit world, we can't look down on the earth and see all of these things or all of these truths. So the things that I've been teaching you the last year, many of you still have sort of doubts about them and so forth because it, you feel that many of these things can't be verified. Now that problem doesn't exist for a spirit. For a spirit, they can go and verify almost everything that I've actually said in these classes. And so that makes it very easy for them to investigate truth. It also makes it very easy for them to, if they are open-hearted and they have a humble spirit, to actually take on new truth and investigate that. And to investigate it with, with a far less blockages to the process of investigation. So you are actually capable, all of you who are mediums already, are actually capable of, he of helping huge amounts of spirits. Huge amount, and if you can think of spirits as people in the spirit world, you can help huge amounts of people with very little effort. So it's a very, very effective way of assisting the changes that are going to occur here on Earth. And that's one of the reasons why I'm very interested in helping mediums develop their gift and also helping healers develop their gift. Because both of those, both of those methodologies are actually relationships between spirit persons and ourselves. And in the end what is going to happen, and this will happen over the coming years, is that spirits will mingle with us here on earth. Once we get into an emotional condition where that's, that's able to be done without somebody wanting to cut them up and experiment on them, um, where, what will happen is this will happen very, very frequently. And so we will actually have a discussion like this where five or ten celestial spirits will come and have a chat with you. Right? So that's the kind of thing that will happen in the future. Now that can't happen at the moment because of the, the general feelings and emotions that most people have towards it occurring and also the needy emotions that are also occurring here on Earth regarding getting help from the spirit world. That speaker keeps being lost. <laughs> that speaker is still having a trouble. Is there any way to fix it? Not really. Not this one. Um, so does everyone understand what, what the motive is, I suppose you'd say, of doing all this? Now, some of you are actually interested in mediumship or interested in healing and may have even been told from a medium or a psychic that you have these healing abilities and you're not aware of how to use them and you're not aware of what will make them stronger and so um, some of you who may not be fully in the space where you can communicate with spirits at this point um, would be very interested in developing that gift as well and so what what is going to be happening over the coming year is we're going to be having a session every month to help those people who want to develop mediumship skills and also healing skills. Now there's going to be sort of like a program if you like which we'll be doing down the track which will uh, help you work through the issues emotionally that prevent you from from utilizing these skills as much as you could possibly use them. And so that's one of the goals too over the coming year is to actually help a large number of people and again, it's all dependent on your desire. So don't come along unless you have this passionate desire to do it. Does that make sense? So these things are just being offered to you so that you can develop your own skills. So that being said, what I'd like to do now is just talk about the laws of rapport, the actual spiritual laws that govern communication between the spirit world and between us here on Earth. Now, this material hasn't been presented very much at all on the Earth. In fact, um, a lot of the material I'll be presenting today hasn't actually been presented on Earth in the format that, that I'll, in, in, and the information hasn't been available. And the reason why this is, is because there is so much misinformation. 
And that's the problem with this whole, uh, whole process. There is so much misinformation that many of us go along, and many of you may have gone along to a psychic or a medium, and felt like you didn't really get much out of it at all. Who's felt like that at times when they've gone? So, yeah, been half to three quarters of the audience. And then other times you go along to a psychic or medium and you come along, uh, come out feeling, wow, that was quite impressive. Um, you know, what happened there? How many of you have had that experience where you've gone along to one, all right, almost the same amount of people? So how does that work? How, how does that work that you can go along to many and not be very impressed at all, it doesn't seem like you're really getting much information, and then go along to others and, uh, and get some really important and information that's been really powerful for you? The other thing that often happens too is that we have this thing going on when, it, when we go to a psychic or medium where we feel almost glorifying of the psychic or medium because of the ability that they have. Right? This happens very often. And so then we become very sensitive to anything that's said and we start feeling that everything that's said must be true. How many of you have felt that going along to a psychic or medium? So, quite a few of you, right? So, so the question then becomes, well, is it all true? Well, of course, over time, after uh, we've gone and we come back and over the following months or years, uh, we see sometimes, well, that wasn't true. Or we see, oh, well, part of it was true, but another part of it wasn't true. So why is there this seeming inaccuracy? You know, if, if the person was talking to a spirit, surely it's just like a communication that we're having. And if, if that's the, the case, then I'm saying something to you, and, and uh, if, if, that, if that thing is repeated, surely that's, that's enough. That, that would be the truth of what that person is feeling. And, uh, and why, why would I then assume that that, that that communication is all the truth, for example? And why would I then assume that it's actually God's truth, for example? So there's lots of emotions that are involved in this process. Now, for that reason, mediums have a lot of power. And also, with all powerful gifts, a lot of responsibility. You see, there's a lot of responsibility in the sense that they can use their gift for good or they can use their gift for evil. And in fact, they can actually use their gift in a manner that they're not even aware they're using it, that it's actually harming people. And so it becomes very important for us to understand that the gift that we have is a gift that needs to be used wisely, just like any other gift that we would have. And that we can damage people with this gift or we can assist them with the gift. It all depends on firstly our motive and our knowledge and our understanding. And you can damage someone without even knowing it, can't you? Like there's been many times in our own lives, haven't there, in the day-to-day -day interaction where we've said or done something that we didn't think would have such a powerful effect on somebody and yet they've gone away and acted upon it and felt damaged by it. And so the problem with the mediumship gift is that it can also be a conduit for spirits to actually damage people on earth. And that's another problem that uh, exists with it. So that all being said, it's very important to understand the gift. Now you remember yesterday during our discussion, right the first half of the discussion when we are talking about the law of attraction, many of you were feeling really sleepy and tired and detuned. So many of you here were feeling those feelings. And that was the reason why was that there was a whole group of spirits who when I began the law of attraction discussion and I was talking about all of the <coughs> powerful effects of the law of attraction on us and the fact that their, their location in the spirit world was totally dependent upon their own soul condition and the law of attraction. And when I had that soul condition discussion yesterday with, it, with all of you, there were lots and lots of spirits who became very, very depressed. And the reason why they became so depressed is they, they came to a realisation that the reason why they are in a certain location in the spirit world is because of their soul condition. And then of course, where do you go with that? You want to know straight away how to get rid of this soul condition that created your attraction, you see. But they were becoming very frustrated with me because sometimes I'm a little long-winded with my explanations. <laughs> and so it wasn't until about halfway through the discussion when we started talking about you know, the emotions and how to release the emotions and how you can release and grow soul conditions through that, that this, the feeling began to lighten for all of us. 
Now, can you see that that group of spirits actually heavily influenced all of us during that discussion? Right? And very few of us were aware of why we were feeling like we were feeling. And the truth is that spirits are constantly influencing us. Every single one of us has more than one and usually many spirits surrounding us that are constantly attracted to us and constantly influencing us. Now, of course, if you are a person who's known to be a person who can communicate with spirits, how many more spirits do you think are surrounding you? And this is why many people who have the gift of mediumship are hassled constantly by spirits. Right? And so they feel under a lot of pressure, a lot of, uh, and they feel a lot of, uh, you know, they can't even sleep many times because they're constantly hearing voices all through the nights and, and it becomes very difficult. And it's important to understand why all of those things are happening. So what happens for many people who are mediums in particular is they want to turn off the gift. Right? So many of you here have had that experience, haven't you, where you've felt these impressions come and you've had people talking to you and then you just all you want to do is get away from it because it feels very, very has it hassles you constantly. So obviously the spirits that are connecting to you in those situations are not high level spirits, are they? Because if they were, they wouldn't be hassling you constantly and keeping you awake all night. They would actually be just demonstrating love. And so what a person then goes down the track of saying to themselves is, why do I get hassled by these low-level spirits all the time who are causing me all of this, you know, sleepless nights and damaging relationships and all sorts of things in my life? And so it's important to understand what is going on for those in, in those situations. So what we want to do firstly is just remind ourselves about the soul. So the soul is... So here's my soul, my spirit body, and my material, my material body. What is the soul in you? It's your passions, passions desires, intentions, emotions, memories, experiences. It's got intelligence as well. So it's all of those things. That's your soul. So this is your soul. Now, yesterday when we had the discussion about the soul, and we said we described soul condition, and soul condition was the sum total of all of those things wrapped up together in terms of how much love there is in every one of those. So, for instance, if I have a desire, any desire whatsoever, the thing that determines that how that determines my soul condition is that if that desire is harmonious with natural love, then my soul condition will be a bit higher than if that's, that desire was disharmonious with love. Does that make sense? And if that desire was harmonious with fear and hatred and all those other kinds of emotions, then obviously my soul condition is going to be quite low. So can you see how we can have a desire? For instance, let's look at one desire, the desire for sex. It's inbuilt within us. Right? Now that desire is there inbuilt within us. How we use that desire can be completely harmonious with divine love or it can be totally, almost in complete disharmony with love at all. Can you see just that one desire? How our soul condition may range between that great variation, if you like, of harmonious or at one with God with that desire or totally disharmonious and, and totally out of harmony with all of God's laws with that desire. Now, that's the issue that we face when we're talking about mediumship as well. So we'll, we'll look at that issue. But it's important to understand that the soul is the thing of importance. It's your soul condition. Remember we said yesterday, your soul condition governs all of your law of attraction. For a medium, it's the soul condition of the medium that governs all of your law of attraction. For a healer, it's the soul condition of the healer that governs all of your law of attraction. So that means if you're a medium and your soul condition is very disharmonious with love, you are going to attract large groups of spirits who are also in disharmony with love. 
and that is going to influence you greatly. Um, can we mic Tris? Thanks, Matt. Um, Jen, please. Does that mean then if I am repentant in my journey, recognising where I'm at, in soul condition, that those spirits that are attracted to me, that I'm very aware of, there are hundreds of them, in my repentant state, does that then help them to feel repentance? Every... In my communication and my desire to go to God, does, does that then... Imparted to them as well? Not automatically. Um, because it, in the end, a spirit has its own desire. It has its own free will. So many times what happens is we may be working through an emotion as a person on earth, and a spirit may be connected with us just because of that one emotion. So let's say the emotion um, is one for yourself, rage. All right, so there's a rageful emotion inside. Well, let's pick murder. There, there's lots here. So there's a... Around me because of the, that murderous tendency. That's right. Hundreds of them. That's right. So the emotion inside of you is one of, you know, feeling so rageful that you're almost willing to go and commit a murder. Does that make sense? And that in itself will attract a group of spirits who have murderous tendencies. Now, they won't look at the rest of your condition. So they won't, unless they have a pure heart, they will not look at the rest of your condition. So in other words, what they see when they look at you often is they're looking at your spirit form more than your material form. And what they'll see is this huge amount of anger and rage in you, right? And so what they see, they see it as a colour. And they know that anyone with that colour, they can connect to an influence. Does that make sense? Um, well, in the case of murderous tendencies, it's like a, it's like a bright burgundy red, uh, but it also is shaped of arrows and everything coming out of it. And so you will see, you will see the spirits will see that colour and shape, and know that they may be able to influence a person in in that condition on earth to actually commit murder, even if that was their desire. So is it like a parasitic type of yes. attraction? It's like a parasitic attraction. So a person who's a medium is also subject to these attractions perhaps even more than the average person. Because not only can the, can the spirit see that emotion within the medium, but they also know through their communication with the medium that they can communicate thoughts and feelings to the medium that might enhance that emotion. Yes, they do. And that's what happens with you quite a lot. So the key within yourself is to actually deal with the core emotion, and we'll talk about that later in the, in the session today. Um, so everyone understands, though, that the soul is the key factor here. Always the soul is the key factor with communication. So no matter how good a medium I am, and many mediums are born with the ability because they don't have the injuries that prevent them from exercising uh, that particular ability. All of you are capable of mediumship. All of you are capable of spirit communication. But some of you, just like an artist or a musician or some other kind of talent, have the talent from the time you were born. Does that make sense? And others of you will develop that talent over time, just like a person who learns the piano <coughs> develops that talent over time, but a child prodigy knows how to play it by the time they're five. You follow me? So many of you who are mediums have been aware that you're medium right, right from a young age. And you can remember having communication with spirits and you thought were your friends and some of them looked ugly and some of them you were afraid of and some of them you were so afraid of that you turned the whole thing off. You know, and so those kind of things happen quite regularly. Others of you have been become mediums because of your condition slowly increasing and your awareness through perhaps some new age philosophies and so forth, so forth, your awareness has become more open and so you become more open to spirit communication. Whatever way that's occurring, understand that it's your soul condition that determines what spirits are going to be attracted to you. Now, of course, if we have a very, very good soul condition, it does not mean that we're only going to attract spirits in good soul condition. What it means, though, is that we have the ability to determine inside of ourselves whether a spirit is in good condition or not. 
and we have the ability to know whether we need to help that person or whether the information coming to us is actually going to help people on earth. Because obviously, if the, if the information coming from the spirit is higher than our own condition, then it's going to help me. If the information coming from the spirit is lower than my own condition, then it's going to harm me. Does that make sense? And so I'll be far better off trying to help the spirit in that situation rather than allowing that spirit to help myself. And so after a while what happens is that your own soul condition, you will start to be able to feel when a spirit is actually more harmonious with love or disharmonious with love. And that will be very, very important for your own progression. So, how, what, how do we actually tell what's going on in terms of these connections? And this gets to the subject of hierarchy of truths. So in the handout that I've given you, you notice that I've listed a hierarchy of truths. The first set of truths that a spirit can communicate to you or help you with is what I would call the physical. <coughs> Or, or you could also call it maybe the scientific, scientific truths. Um, now, for a spirit who's passed, a spirit in any condition can investigate scientific truth. So you can be in the depths of hells and have a scientific bent, just like you would have perhaps when you're on Earth, and you can investigate lots of physical and scientific truths. It's quite simple because you can go from place to place as a spirit world, in the spirit world, and experiment. You know, scientists here on Earth, what they do is they create experiments trying to satisfy truths. They're looking for truths in the natural universe. And in the process of doing that, what they do is they create an experiment and they use that experiment to validate or support the evidence for that particular truth, don't they? And that's a general scientific method that is carried forth and enhanced in the spirit world. And a spirit in any condition can do it. So, if a medium is receiving truths about the physical earth and scientific truths about your physical universe, then obviously the spirit doesn't have to be of high development. And yet, sometimes, we become so engrossed with the truth, the physical truth that we didn't know, that we think that spirit must know lots of things, and they do know lots of things you don't know, here. But they might still be in the first fear of the spirit world with some very, very core uh, damaging emotions that they're not even looking at, because all they want to do is investigate physical truths. So the lowest form of truth that you can receive as a medium is actually physical truths. That refers to events as well as actions, as well as future <coughs> events, as well as, and you can just keep on adding to that list, couldn't you? So let's, how many of you have gone along to a medium and Uncle Fred comes along in, in the mediumship and he tells you that in a few days' time something's going to happen and you need to make this decision if it's going to work for you. Now, sure enough, in a few days' time, what he said would happen, happened. And what did you think? Wow, that was amazing, right? But it's really easy for him because he's in a physical, he's in a state where he can look in the physical state. He's not governed by time, so he can look forward and beyond back. He can see more of the conditions of people around you and know what they're thinking and when they're deciding to think, when they will do it and all those kind of things. They, he can come up with all those things and tell you the event in advance quite easily, particularly if it's only a few days away. And, and he can describe it to you. Now, how did that help you develop in love? That's the question I have didn't help at all, did it? Did it help you develop your own free will? Probably not. In fact, you became reliant on the spirit telling you, so that's probably probably harmed your free will more than anything. And how did it how did it help you with regard to getting to know God? Well not at all. 
did it help you become reliant on somebody or reliant on yourself? Well, reliant on him, probably. Can you see what's happening? We become seduced by the fact that it was true. But it's really, really easy for him, no matter, it doesn't matter what condition he's in. He's re it's really, really easy for him to present these facts to you. So, for that reason, those truths, and they are truths, they are truths of the physical and scientific universe, and they are truths of your life. But those kind of truths have less, are less valuable, if you like, for your soul. Because they only have a physical effect, and many times have a damaging effect on your soul, in terms of developing your free will or developing your love and so forth. So those are what I would call the lower, lower truths, the lowest kind of truths, in fact, that you could actually receive. Then we go on to the very fascinating area, generally, when we progress as a medium, into what we call the metaphysical. Or you could label it the, the spiritual universe. So it's the physical matter of the spiritual universe. So as I've described, every single... Remember, every sphere that I've mentioned is actually a universe in itself. It's a dimensional space. It has physical matter in it. And those, that physical matter is able to be investigated when you are, and particularly when you are a spirit. So it's very, very easy again for any spirit in any location of the spirit world from the first sphere upwards to actually involve himself in metaphysical investigation and therefore transmit those truths through a medium to, to the earth. This area becomes very fascinating for us on earth because we start understanding a wide variety of things in the spirit world that are occurring. But the problem is that it's only dependent upon the condition of the spirit who's presenting the information to you. So if that spirit exists in the first sphere and he's never ever existed in any other sphere of the spirit world, he will present a life to you which may even mirror or very closely resemble the life that you might experience here on earth. How many of you uh, have read Life in the World Unseen? Uh, it's a quite a good channeling, it's on the CDs. And it's really worth reading, but again, channeled by a spirit who is existing in the first sphere. And many of you have read uh, the one that I sent out recently uh, by um, Jane Sherwood, Postmortem Journal. Did many of you have a read of that? All right. That is D. H. Lawrence, so Lawrence of Arabia's experience in the spirit world and passing. But when he gets right to the end and he's explaining about reincarnation, he's explaining about all these spiritual concepts. He's actually explaining them from a first sphere perspective. Now, you wouldn't know that, would you? Reading it initially, you would think, wow, this is pretty good information and it feels resonant because obviously there will be spirits with you who feel resonant with it as well. You'll get little tingly things as you're reading and that's the little tingles from spirit world, you know, when they're telling you, yeah, I agree with this and I agree with that. And you're thinking, yeah, this is sounding pretty good, right? But in reality, the material is from that first and second sphere location in the spirit world. And almost all channeling that exists on earth today has come from those two locations, the first or second sphere. There is very little channeling that has come from spheres higher than those two locations. And the reason why is that there are very few mediums on earth who are developed enough to receive information of a higher degree of love than those locations. So the metaphysical, again, very fascinating area that we can receive lots of information about as a medium, but again, it can be highly distorted when it comes to truth because it's to do with the scientific investigation and the scientific investigation is usually one of experimentation, it's not one of knowing for sure. And you can see this on the earth too, can't you? Like years and years and years ago, right in the dark ages, they thought that the sun revolved around the earth, didn't they? And from the earth's perspective, that's exactly what it looked like, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. right? But then when they start investigating the planets and the relationship with the planets to the sun, then they started realizing, and this is how you know the first telescopes helped in this process, of realizing, oh, hang on a second, no, the actual earth revolves around the sun. 
Now there was a huge outcry when they came out. The man who actually, who was it? It was um, Galileo. Galileo was put in, was put in prison by the Catholic Church uh, because of his findings, and he stayed in prison for many years as a result. Right? So so why why was that? Because man wouldn't accept what seemed to be the most logical thing. So now if I had passed as a spirit, obviously I can investigate that far more thoroughly, can't I? And I can see whether that was the truth or not. And I can present that truth to the earth through a medium who's versed in it. But how does it help people on earth? It really only helps them understand science, doesn't it? It doesn't really help them understand anything about themselves, anything about love, anything about developing the soul, anything about growing infinitely, anything about the spirit world and their progression, the law of attraction, the law of compensation, the law of desire, any of those things, none of those things are even discussed in that entire process, are they? So how, how important is this information really in the end? For our soul, it's not very, not very much important. It can be a sidetrack. In fact, yeah, most of the time it is a sidetrack. A sidetrack, something that is sidetracking our soul, it's developing. Then we get another set of information, and now we're starting to get to more deeper things. We start getting to moral truths. Now, moral truths are what I would, I would call information that it starts to affect the soul now. So before we've covered the physical truths and the spiritual truths, and they affect the physical, really, but the moral truths start affecting the soul. And what do I mean by moral truths? Well, here's a moral truth. If you murder, you are out of harmony with love. That's a moral truth. And if you're even more developed, you will receive this message about murder. If you even think of murdering, you are already a murderer. That's a moral truth too. And that's why in the first century I said that a man looking at a woman so as to have sex with her has already committed adultery in his heart. Right? So these are moral truths. Now, obviously, if I'm okay with adultery, I'm not going to receive a moral truth about adultery, am I? If I'm okay with murder, I'm not going to receive a moral truth about murder. There are many people on earth as mediums who justify murder as, you know, the, the conflict between good and bad, the yin and yang concept, right? And so they go down the track of saying there's no bad and there's no good. There's no, in other words, there is no morals. And those mediums can't receive information about morals as a result. And yet there are many, many spirits in the spirit world who want to transmit information about morals because their morality when they're on earth has deeply affected their condition where they are now and what's happening to them right now and how much pain they're in right now. Does that make sense? Can you give an example of that? Um, in what way? How their morality all right, yeah, certainly. And there's a pageant message that's worth reading. It's about a man who's in the 1800s, and I think I might have mentioned him before. A man who, when he was on Earth, he used to collect rabbits from the wild for scientific experiments. So he'd collect all of these rabbits, he'd get them alive, and he'd take them in to scientists, and they'd cut them up alive most of the time and experiment on them, you know, looking at organs and looking at all those kind of things. For the progress of humanity, if you can call it that, right? And then some of those rabbits also got used in experiments with regard to things like perfumes and so, and so forth, right? Now when he passed, at the time before he passed, he felt that was fine. He felt there was nothing wrong with that. But when he passed, the law kicked in where he became very, very conscious of the law of compensation about the fact that he had caused the destruction of many, many animals and caused a lot of pain in the process, both in the animals and in the people who were giving, giving the animals to. And so this moral law kicked in. The law of compensation exposed it to him and he came to James Paget wanting to know how to get out of it, like how to progress, because he felt really bad. His, 
his conscience, which is the disparity between the truth and our own actions, kicked in. And when that kicks in, it starts kicking us, generally. And so that's what started to happen for him. Now, he was not aware of that moral law before he passed. But he also would have been very, very happy to let lots of people on earth know to be aware of that moral law. Does that make sense? Because it would prevent all of their pain when they passed. And it would prevent a lot of pain happening on the earth as well. Does that make sense? Jen? Just okay, so... If we, if we do the mic. This is a very strong influence. His name is Norman. He wrote his story down. He then interacted with Joseph Smith and started the Mormon Church. Yep. And his grief is now. Yeah. Many, many hundreds of thousands of spirits are trapped between first and sixth sphere. And can't, and can't move forward and his sense of because he has a huge amount of grief because of his teachings being responsible for their condition mm. and there are still people on the earth too today promoting that in that those beliefs. organization trapped and he, he come, comes to me and begging for Yeah, there's a lot of grief in him. He, he, he wants, what he wants is a medium who's able to channel um, what he now knows. What, the difference between, <coughs> between what he channeled to Joseph Smith and what he now knows. And that's what he would like to do. And, and this is part of the problem is when we start teaching things on earth, and, and most of the teachings on earth come from the spirits, you see. So, so Joseph Smith is said to be the founder of the Mormon Church, but in reality, it's the spirit who's the founder of the Mormon Church who channeled this material to Joseph Smith. Does that make sense? And so that spirit bears the primary responsibility for the creation of any falsehood that Joseph Smith channeled. Would Joseph Smith be aware that he was spirit-influenced? Uh, certainly, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and he has the same grief. Uh, yeah, because he, he now sees the things that he was doing on earth as well. And so it's very important for these spirits to, to start learning about the ways to progress in the spirit world. The focus of this discussion, though, is more about how we can assist them and what's going on with their other soil condition. So I would like to have another discussion where we're really focused on the spirits themselves and helping their spirits. And in fact, that it was some, what, some of the things we'll be doing in these sessions that we plan for the future is actually sitting down and actually helping these spirits uh, through their emotions so that they can work through their emotions about how, their, their condition. And so I know that that's a bit frustrating for both those spirits. But um, if we can have this focus, because what we need to do is get lots of mediums first on earth who can help them. And uh, once we've got that, then obviously these spirits will get lots of help. Now, does that make sense though? What, what happened uh, with regard to many of these channelings that came through is that they have affected hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people on earth. And therefore, every single one of those people who pass, pass with a belief system that is either harmonious with love or disharmonious with love. Now, many of the belief systems are mostly harmonious with natural love, but very few are harmonious with divine love. And so once these spirits learn about the divine love path, which many of these spirits have, they still have huge amounts of grief to work through and allow themselves to work through about the actual process that they were involved in influencing so much pain on the earth. And that's the thing that we need to bear in mind, is that even from a moral perspective, teaching the truth has its benefits, but teaching falsehood has huge repercussions, not just for the medium or the spirit, but also for the people that are influenced by their teachings. So it's a huge repercussions. Now, again, we can get out of any of these conditions 
and we can progress from any of these spaces. So all the spirits who are concerned about that need to realize that we're, we can get out of these conditions and progress from those spaces by just a willingness to experience the emotion of it all, just the same as here on Earth. Does everyone understand how morals are a bit more important? Can you see how it's a bit more important to start channeling the truth about morality? Because it has a huge effect, not just now, but also in your life in the spirit world. It will actually, you, your morals will determine whether you arrive in the first sphere or in the second or third or fourth spheres in the spirit world. Um, you're just, just your morals will determine that. Okay, so there's morality. That's the next highest level of truth. That is one type of truth that the earth badly needs to hear and still has a lot of trouble with on the earth. Now the next highest level of truths are all to, and morals come under this uh, label, the laws of natural love. So let's just call them the laws of natural love. So the next highest truths that you could actually receive and give to the earth or communicate are these laws of natural love. Now, the laws of natural love involve things like morality, but they also are much wider than that. They involve things like the law of attraction that I was teaching you yesterday. That's a law. That's a natural love law and a divine love law. It incorporates both, but, but it's a law of natural love. It's one of the laws that God gave. The law of desire is another one. Right? The law of rapport that we're going to speak about in a minute is a law of natural love as well. A lot of these laws can be communicated from spirits to people on earth. However, the person on earth has to be in the emotional space and the belief space and everything to be able to receive them. So if they are in a very good condition in natural love, they will start being able to receive those laws. So they, you could say those are the, the next highest. The highest truths that you can receive are really the laws of divine love. The reason why they are the highest truths, aside from it perhaps being quite obvious, the fact that you're receiving love from God to a point of abundance with God, so the fact that it will create huge amounts of bliss, is that the laws of divine love are the laws that are the highest in the hierarchy of the universe. And those laws control every other law. And in fact, every other law is subservient to these laws. So when you learn these laws, you automatically learn the other laws. You don't even have to learn the other laws. They come to you automatically by just learning these laws of divine love. So the divine love laws also have the benefit that they are everlasting. They will affect the progress of your soul eternally. So when you learn, like isn't it great learning something and know that you're going to use it for the rest of your life? Like, how many of you felt that when you were learning something that you might have learned through your life and you realise, wow, I'm going to learn use that the rest of my life. This is so powerful. Right? And it's a lovely feeling, isn't it, that enters you when you have that feeling. And the laws of divine love are those laws. All of those laws are the laws that will influence you for the rest of your existence. And that's why they are the most powerful laws. And that's also why they're the most powerful laws to channel. They're the most powerful truths to channel. The problem is that to, to actually hear any of these laws, the person who's receiving them needs to already have divine love in their soul. You follow me? So, so it's going to be very, very important for the earth to actually receive more of these laws. But to do that, there's going to need to be mediums who are developing themselves in the, on the divine path. And not what they think the divine path is, but rather what the divine path really is. Because there's a lot of mediums who believe they're on the divine path and actually on the natural love path. So, they're the highest possible laws. So, can you see the hierarchy? And can you see how it would affect your communication with spirits? Now, if you're receiving constant barrage of just mundane things, then you know straight away what kind of spirit is being connected to, don't you? If you're receiving more of a barrage of influencing you morally, then you know that maybe the spirit is, is a high spirit. If you're not receiving a barrage at all, then you know that's probably the highest spirit. Because the highest spirit would never barrage you or 
you know, be overt in their influence of you, uh, trying to control you, and so you know that it would even be a higher spirit. Because a higher spirit, one of the laws of divine love is a law of free will. And a higher spirit will never want to influence your free will, negatively or positively. Right? They'll just want to tell you the choices you have and allow you to make the choice. So they are the higher spirits. So can you see how just knowing the hierarchy of laws, straight away you can also determine what kind of spirit you're talking to. However, from an intellectual perspective, that all sounds fine. But do you know that a person on the first sphere can just start using all of the terminology of a seventh sphere spirit? And if you can't feel their emotional condition, you won't be able to tell the difference. So it's like somebody reading up on divine love, learning all the terminology, who's a murderer, coming inside of here just for the point of view of wanting to knock off a few of you and, and actually using these to create, create connections with you. That's, a spirit can do that. And a person on earth could do it too, it's true. Of course I don't know why they probably want to do it, but they could do it. And this is the problem for all of us, is I can tell you all the hierarchical laws of the universe and how they all work and what kind of truths are the highest truths, but if you can't feel the emotional condition, if you can't feel the soul condition of the person connecting with you, you can receive all sorts of information from people masquerading as the people you're thinking you're talking to. Now right at the moment there are literally hundreds of thousands of mediums on earth talking to Jesus. And the majority of them have no conversation with Jesus. They're actually talking to spirits who are masquerading as me. The reason why those spirits want to do that is because straight away many of them will listen and straight away a rapport can develop. Does that make sense? And this happens with my mother Mary, it happens with and other spirits all the time. There are literally hundreds of thousands of mediums being deluded because they can't tell the soul condition of the spirit talking to them. And when the person just uses the terminology that connects, so like for, for many of these spirits, all they've got to do is read the Bible, which by the way you can do in a few seconds in the spirit world. You can remember everything. And then I can just reuse that terminology over and over again with whomever I'm connecting to. So I could go along to a person who's a really devoted Catholic, for example, who's a medium, and I could present myself as Jesus, start talking to them using the terminology that I read in the Bible, and is that person going to be able to tell the difference? Well, if their soul condition isn't higher than the spirits, they will not be able to tell the difference. So can you see what's going on for many? So, all the laws are great. Knowing them here is great. But it's only when we start to feel them emotionally It's only when you have the ability as a spirit to feel the emotional and spiritual condition, the soul condition of the person communicating with you, that you will be able to know the difference. Now that's a very important piece of information to know, isn't it, as a medium. So in other words, if I refuse to open up myself emotionally as a medium, I will not ever be able to tell the difference of someone who's masquerading as the person or actually the person. Now I've had many, many conversations in the last five years with mediums where they have not been able to tell who they're actually speaking to. To give you an example, I had a conversation with a lady in the USA and she had two spirits come to her. They called themselves Peter and Gabriel, the Apostle Peter and the Archangel Gabriel. And this is actually written down in that reincarnation information that I presented. And they presented themselves as Peter, Apostle Peter and Archangel Gabriel because it meant that she would listen to them. And they presented a lot of very good material on the natural love path. 
So they weren't malevolent spirits. They were actually, I felt they were in the second or third sphere of the spirit world. On the natural love path. And the reason why they allowed her to continue in her belief that they were someone that they weren't was because they wanted the rapport with her to teach these truths. The way they looked upon it was that their desire was pure to teach more moral truths on the earth. And so what they did was they, they allowed the medium to continue in her belief rather than telling her the truth. Now when we had the discussion and I said, well actually they're not the Apostle Peter and the Archangel Gabriel, they, she actually confronted them about that and they admitted to her that they weren't. Now, if you've been channeling a spirit for five or six or seven, ten years, who have said to be one person, and then you find out for that five to ten years they've been lying to you, or not so much lying to you, but just not telling you the truth, how would you feel? Well, she felt quite upset. Now, what I tried to do is encourage her to try some experiments, which she did try, and they did too. And eventually what happened is these spirits got onto the Divine Love Path. Now they were in a much better condition. But because she was so affected by the fact that they'd lied to her, she didn't want to talk to them anymore. And after lots and lots of encouragement, I still am not sure whether she wants that she is talking to them or not. So everyone with me so far about that? What's going on with that with the mediumship um, issue? So can you see how important it is? to actually know the soul condition of the spirits you're communicating to. Very, very important. If their soul condition is one of deceit, in other words, they're totally interested in continuing to deceive you for malevolent reasons, then obviously they must be in the hells of the first sphere. If their soul condition is one of deceit, but they're willing to deceive you in order to teach truths onto the earth, then their soul condition will be anywhere between the first and the sixth sphere. But if they are on the divine love path, they will never ever choose to deceive you. The reason why is that on the natural love path, many people do feel that what's best for you, whether you know it or not, is what's best for you. <laughs> In other words, it's a bit like a mum or a dad saying to you, I know what's best for you, and maybe they do. Um, and you wanting to do something different and they influence you through their influence because they're telling you, I know what's best for you. Now, that is not in harmony with the law of free will. The law of free will would enable you to do your own and make your own choices, even if your choices were going to be negative for you. That's the way God operates with you. And that's the way a spirit who's at one with God will operate with you. So that a spirit of one with God will actually allow you to go off on a path that's quite damaging to you. And they'll wait until you've exhausted yourself on that path and you plead with them to have some information again to get you back on the right path. Whereas a spirit on the natural love path will often not do that. They will heavily influence you if they feel that you are off the path that they feel is best for you. And for that reason, there is a lot of people that we speak to um, on the, about the Divine Love Path who don't want to follow the Divine Love Path only because the spirits with them are telling them not to do it. And the spirit influence is so great and powerful and their own emotional condition is so doubtful that they are easily influenced into not following a path that could be to their eternal benefit. And you will see this happen all the time in your own discussions with people around you as well. You will feel, particularly if you're a medium, you will feel the influence of the spirit who is with the person. Right, so can you see the importance of what I'm saying here about feeling the emotional condition or feeling the soul condition of the spirit? This applies also to spirits who are healers. Many spirits in the first sphere are masquerading as healers. And you know what they actually do? They actually suck the emotional energy from the person that you're healing. So cool. And the person actually works out, walks out in more pain. Have any of you had that experience? Where you've actually gone to a healer, so-called healer, and actually walked out in more physical pain than when you began? 
well, what was actually happening was a spirit was actually taking uh, emotion and physical energy from you, not giving it to you. And that meant that the person who was doing the mediumship, or the healing in this case, is actually in the same condition as that spirit, wanting to take energy from you. So can you see how even a healer, if I go to a healer who has that desire, I can actually walk out in a worse condition than what I walked in. So that's an important thing to bear in mind. So, what are some of the... Um, how, how does it actually work? How does this he healing and communication actually work? So we'll talk about the science of it first, and then we'll talk about the emotions of it, because that's the important thing. You are a half of a soul with a spirit form and a material form. Spirits in the spirit world are a half of a soul with a spirit form. So if we have female spirit, half of the soul is connected to a female form. Okay, so this is what we are. We are the soul, and these are just the tools that the soul uses to experience the different dimensional spaces of the universe. So, the soul, with a spirit form, can, can experience any dimensional space from the first sphere to what I'm calling the 21st sphere, depending upon their soul condition. So they could be a very great variety of conditions. Here is you on Earth. And you, by the way, can actually be in any of those conditions too, as a half of a soul. So you can actually be from a first sphere condition anywhere to a 20 seconds, the 21st sphere condition, what I'm calling that 21st sphere condition, on the Earth. Now, if you think about that for a moment, imagine here's the spirit world. So let's say we've got the first one, two, and three, four spheres, if you like. Here's you on Earth. So here's your person, of course, connected with the spirit body and, the, and your soul. So it's the soul that you're talking about. Now, your soul condition could be anywhere from the first sphere to the 21st sphere in that condition of the half of soul. But let's say for the moment that your soul condition is just at the top of the first sphere. So in other words, you're like in a summer land type condition, where if you passed, you'd pass into a very similar environment to the earth, a little bit prettier, and you'd have quite pleasant experiences, not much darkness, you know, you have some stuff to work through, emotions to work through, but not too much darkness. Let's say that's your condition. So you're at this point here, just before the transition into the second sphere. Who is, the, who is going to be the easiest spirit for you to connect with? A spirit who's actually in some land. Does that make sense? Because their connection and your connection has the greatest, what I would call, rapport. In other words, your two conditions are matching each other so well that you will have the greatest rapport with them. Now, if they also have the same religious belief as you, and they also have the same scientific beliefs as you, and they also have very similar emotional condition to you, now we're talking like really, really, really strong attraction. And let's say that when on Earth you'd had a miscarriage or two, and you're a woman on Earth with a miscarriage or two, now a woman in the spirit world who's had a miscarriage or two would be even more attracted to you. Can you see that? Because there's common experience. Now, when on the earth, let's say you were a woman and you had three husbands and the first two husbands were really damaging to you but the third one was loving, and this spirit had almost the same experience as that, imagine now how strong the bond will be between the two of you. Can you see what's going on? The more commonalities there are in your soul condition will create the greater rapport. Now, that also means that if you release those emotions, where those emotional baggages are not in you, so your grief about your miscarriages is gone, your grief about your first two husbands is gone, and you're connected with your father issues, and you've released all of that emotions, and they are gone, and 
Now your condition would be much higher than that. And what kind of spirit would you... Let's say your, spirit, your condition would now be in the four sphere. Which one is going to have the greatest rapport now? It's the spirit on the four sphere. But let's say that you have heavy new age beliefs. You are not interested in the divine path because you feel you already know the divine path. You think the divine path is the natural love path. And you feel that you are going to become a god, very similar to sort of conversation with God style, you know, uh, belief. And you feel that, uh, that you have all of these abilities within yourself. You don't really even believe in God, but you feel that God is the universe. So that you don't believe in a personal God or an entity, but rather you believe God is the universe. Now what kind of spirit in the fourth sphere are you going to connect with? A natural love spirit who's probably had very similar feelings and conditions to yourself in the fourth sphere. You're going to connect to what you'd call a new age spirit sort of thing, wouldn't you? Right? Who's going to be feeding that information. And if he believes in reincarnation, or she believes in reincarnation, and you believe in reincarnation, can you see that I can believe in reincarnation and still be in the fourth sphere? I can. I can be in a very good condition of love and still believe in beliefs that are not true. Right? I can be in the sixth sphere and believe in it. Buddha is one of those in the sixth sphere who believes it. That's why he believes it, because he he's, doesn't believe in God, a personal God. Right? Okay, question? Just. In in your own evolution, when... No, no, if we can do it on the mic, then the mic record a bit better. Thanks. In your own evolution... It's on. In your own evolution, um, when did you realise that reincarnation was an option um, I realised on earth that reincarnation was not a truth. Uh, I had many discussions through John the Baptist. John the Baptist was my friend. Uh, he was my cousin, obviously. And he was very mediumistic. He was a very powerful medium and still is a very powerful medium. And so we had the opportunity to talk to many spirits. And I could see that as John and myself changed our spiritual condition, as we raised our spiritual condition, we were talking to different spirits in different conditions. And so I started to realise that these spirits had progressed without coming back to Earth. So it was very easy to see that reincarnation was not something that was necessary for the progression of the soul. So that all occurred in the first, in the first century, um, before I even passed. And the truth is, all of you who are mediums have total ability to investigate the truth of reincarnation. But you need to know which spirit you're connecting to, and you need to ask them about their own progression, you see. Many times a six fear spirit, Paget, Paget had many times a six fear spirit come to him who still believed in reincarnation. And then Paget said, well, hang on a sec, didn't you progress from the first fear to the six fear? Oh yeah. Did you have to come to earth for that? No. So why do you still believe in reincarnation then? Oh, I don't know, actually. Uh, I just think it might be true still. Right? And the truth is, it did finish up being true as a, as a teaching, but only when you get to the soul union state. So many of them still had a feeling that it might be a true teaching, but they didn't know that it, the way they were teaching it was false, if that makes sense. Um, Jen, you had a... So what's, what, in, when you're in the spirit world, at what level were you aware that it was a possibility of 17, 18? Um, I felt it was a possibility from, from, a, from all, all of my existence in the sense of there might be some form. I never discount a belief unless it can be completely discounted emotionally. In, terms of, in other words, if it's not harmonious with love, I never discount a belief. So the way I saw it was that there are, there are certain types of beliefs of reincarnation that would certainly be harmonious with love. So for that reason, I never discounted those beliefs through my whole existence. Does that make sense? But I never believed they were possible because I hadn't personally experienced them yet. And I couldn't see how that would come about. And I didn't see how that would come about until I experienced the soul union state with my soulmate. And that occurred around in the 1940s of, 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 of last, last century in the spirit world. So, so there was a large difference between you know, what I thought might be possible and an experiential uh, truth which you finish up experiencing. 
Yeah. So if you ask any of these spirits who are in the sixth sphere who still believe in reincarnation, have you personally experienced reincarnation? Every one of them, if they were speaking the truth, and most of them by that stage would know they would have to speak the truth, would answer, well, no, I have not. So, in fact, any six-fifth spirit will speak the truth on that matter and know that they have not personally experienced reincarnation. And generally said. In the spirit world, with the spirits, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Between six and seven. Yeah. The six and seven spheres are very um, difficult. It's, the sixth sphere is, in some ways, very difficult for many spirits because they've become so engrossed in their day-to-day -day life, living this awesome existence where they can create any universe they want, basically. But they're still not experiencing God, and they have this feeling start to develop in their soul that that I'm still missing something. You know how when you have that nagging feeling sometimes, even in the day, you know? Have any of you had that feeling when you walk out the door in the day, I've left something on? <laughs> it's that kind of a feeling, if you can imagine that. But it's that kind of a feeling. They don't know what it is, right? And so they don't know what they left on or what was off, they, but, but they, they feel like they need to investigate. It. Just like sometimes you go back in the house go through the whole place and realise you didn't live <laughs> on it was just something you felt, right? And they have this feeling, so they investigate more, investigate more, investigate more. The problem is they're so used to intellectual investigation that they won't look at an emotional investigation. They don't understand, in fact, that the soul has a whole different way of experiencing truth than the intellect. The soul is completely different in the way that truth is experienced and felt and, and also enters, the truth enters the soul than the intellect does. So many of us are so used to using the intellect to determine truth and what you need to do is get out of that and start using your feelings, emotions, passions, desires to experience the truth. When they make that shift, for many of them, their progress is very rapid because they don't have any moral issues to work through, they're all dealt with. They don't have hardly any emotions left because they've been there for thousands of years and they've forgotten all of their emotions now about you know the earth existence and the things that they did wrong then and all of the law of compensation stuff has been worked through so they don't have any of those negative experiences. So once they make that switch, they progress quite rapidly. But making that switch can be such a terrible experience because you're, you're going from self-reliance to God-reliance. You're going from being total in personal control of your life to total out of personal control of your life. That's a pretty big shift, isn't it? Even for us on Earth, we realise that shift, right? That's like diving off the cliff like I talked about a few weeks ago. And for the spirit, it's the same experience. Does that make sense? How do they um, do they often have to go back? And they have to go back generally to the third sphere and uh, they learn some truths in the third sphere about the soul that they neglected to learn and then they progress on the soul truths through to the fifth sphere and then they learn more about the soul truths in the fifth sphere and then they can progress to the seventh sphere and then they learn about actually losing the, inter losing the mind as the controlling factor and the soul becomes the dominant factor and that process of actually losing your mind completely and going into soul completely is the process of becoming born again. So, so they have to go through this process of unlearning the intellect and learning the soul. James, you had a... Yeah. Well, my question is something along the same line, but if, if the question that came through is that do you then lose identity when you shift from one to the other? No. And this is something that is a very strong fear in many spirits, is that they believe that when you start connecting to God, and there's many teachings on earth actually, when you think about it, that teach you that when you connect to God, you lose yourself. And in fact, many of the New Age teachings actually say that in a way, don't they? They say that we are all fragments of God in an entity point of view. In other words, 
there's one entity, the universe, which we will call God, and then we are all just fragments of the universe. In other words, we don't really have a personal entity. And then that gets heightened as they progress towards the sixth sphere, this idea that we don't have personal, have a personal identity. Now, that is very much the case of where Buddha is at the moment. He's in this place where he believes he has no personal identity. And he calls that place Nirvana. But it's actually a very, very damaging place to live in because you cannot progress from that place without regaining your identity. So that's one of the things that Buddha will go through at some point in the future. Now, the, the issue then becomes what actually happens to identity. But what happens to identity is you as an entity just continue to expand. You continue, as you receive more and more divine love, you continue to expand, not, in your, not only in your capacity to experience emotion, or your capacity to experience an infinite universe, but you also expand as a soul, physically as a soul. You expand in your capacity of, of communication, of experiencing love, and all of these things just continue to expand. And your identity becomes even more firm than it has been before. And you realize the uniqueness of what God created in you. So you're still one of God's children, still being nursed, if you like, by God, developing all the way through, but you have now got these expanded capacities that uh, you never ever realized, or even intellectually conceived, were possible. So the issue that faces many six-year spirits, and I, and I know this is a bit of a digression, but it is something that these spirits want to know at the moment, so it is good to mention them. The issue facing a six-fear spirit, so that we've got the spheres, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. And the sixth sphere is the pinnacle of natural love. So it's the highest you can ever develop in natural love. So this is the pinnacle of natural love. You have many, many spheres above this, many dimensions above this, um, many dimensional existences, even as a half of a soul above that location. So you have the seventh, the eighth, and so forth, above that location. But to get to this location, you've had to develop primarily your intellect and your morals. You've had to work through moral issues and develop your intellect. You've also had to clear away emotions, but the way you've probably done that is not by utilising an emotional process, but rather using your intellect to work your way through emotional issues. So what happens is you can progress in that way, there's quite a slow progression. Some have done it in 50 to 100 years, and the spirit will progress from the first fear to the sixth fear in natural love. But historically, there are many that have taken many thousands or even tens of thousands of years to transverse those spheres or those dimensions. Now when the spirit gets to that location, so he's up here, he's obviously got a very, very highly developed intellect. He knows scientifically the physical and spiritual universe so well. You imagine living for 20,000 years, if you can conceive that, what you can investigate in that time. And as a spirit, you can just flip from here to here to here to here to here. It's not like you're constrained by transportation or cost. So imagine that. It is a huge amount of knowledge you have, right? So they have this huge amount of knowledge, but the problem is the knowledge is in their spirit body's mind, and it has influenced the soul. But the soul has a part of it that has yet to even begun to be developed in many cases. And that is, the soul, the, when the divine love enters the soul, the soul begins a transformation process. So you can think of this, down here we are the grub, if you like. Up there, we're the best a grub could be. Right? So we're super grub. Right? But the transformation into the butterfly is a metamorphosis transformation. And it goes through this process where the soul begins receiving divine love and it starts changing. It, it changes from a human soul. And in fact, the spirit body of a person who's receiving divine love to the point of the seventh sphere changes. It no longer has seven chakras, for example. 
So all of this material on Earth that talks about having seven shark primary shark is where there's what is it 192 meridians or something like that. I don't know exactly, but and all of those things are truths only for a natural love spirit. As soon as the spirit starts receiving divine love, the soul itself goes through a transformation process. And this transformation process happens to you here on earth as you're receiving divine love too. The soul actually goes through a transformation process that affects the spirit bodies. And the spirit body starts having more chakras and some chakras actually start merging as well. You have more meridians as well crossing, crossing your spirit form. So as those changes occur, right, it looks to another spirit like you're different. You're a different model, if you like. There's a natural love model, and this one over here is a different model. I don't know this model, right? This model seems a bit different to me. And so there are many spirits in the sixth sphere who actually believe God created two types of entities who live on Earth. One type of entity that can only go to the sixth sphere, and another type of entity that can transcend the sixth sphere into the higher spheres. Now that is not true. And if you think about it from a point of view of love, it makes sense that it's not true, doesn't it? Why would God be have two people here on earth side by side who he created differently? Is that partial or impartial? Right? If it's partial, then is it harmony with love? Obviously not, right? But many of these spirits don't conceive that because they're intellectually, they're just looking at the results. They're looking at that person has that spirit form, seven chakras, all working really well, great. That person there, oh, they're pretty different. Um, they have different chakras and everything. Not all of them are working great either. <laughs> you know, because there might be emotional injuries still in the person who's received divine love, right? So they see them a bit differently. And so that spirit often then has its only its intellect to work its way through these issues. Now, can you see that if you just use your intellect, you're going to be bound by quite a few constraints. You're not going to be able to, you're going to come up with explanations for yourself that explain to yourself why there's these different forms. Aren't you? And you, some of those explanations might sound totally logical and you experiment them using your scientific methods, which are all to do with your mind, and they'll sound totally logical to you. And this is the reason why much of the information coming to Earth, coming from the sixth sphere, is still out of harmony with divine truth, because it's still not true. It's still just <coughs> experimental. So this sixth sphere spirit's in this experimental phase still. He's searching for this feeling, he can feel this feeling inside of him, I've left something on inside the house. Right? <laughs> something's, going, something's going on, I don't know what it is, that's the feeling he's got right inside of him. But he doesn't know how to investigate it, in many cases. And the only way to investigate it is for this soul part of him to switch in, the emotional part of him to switch in, and become dominant. That's the only way to investigate it. But he doesn't know that. He only thinks it's the intellectual way. And so can you see he may stay in that state for many years, maybe even hundreds of years, before he eventually gets to the point where he decides he's going to experiment with this emotional thing and experiment with this soul thing. And when he does that, the first thing he's told generally is to go back to the third sphere. Now can you imagine that for a moment? You're in a dimensional space that has you feel like you've got unlimited control of your external universe. And you're now being told to go to a space one, two, three levels lower than you. Because you missed out on some truth that you didn't receive at that point. Now what quality are you going to need? Humility. You're going to need to feel one emotion that perhaps you didn't know everything. Because there are many spirits in this state who feel they know so much more than what you know here on earth, they feel they know everything compared to what you know. And yet, they don't know about this soul thing, this soul transformation. And so, many of them refuse to even make the investigation. And they'll search for another few hundred years about some alternatives to what it might be. 
And many of these spirits have been responsible for channeling of material, like the Urantia book, for example. You've heard of that? The Urantia book has been channeled from that location. <coughs> because it's a six-sphere spirit trying to understand the complexities of the universe that they can't understand until they receive divine love and understand that it's all very, very simple. Right? And they're trying to understand it with their intellect. So that is a major transition that many of the six fear spirits who are listening to this discussion even now have not yet made. And once they make that transition from there to there, they then will progress developing themselves emotionally at the soul level rather than spiritually at the metaphysical level. And then they will progress. And as they progress, their identity will become even more solid than it ever was before. They will understand themselves even better. And they will also start to understand conceptions of things from an experiential perspective. So it's a hot different, isn't it, talking about walking through that wall and actually walking through the wall, isn't it? Can you see that? One, one thing is just talking about it, but you beat your head against it and it never happens. The other thing is actually you do it. And that's the difference between them here and them here. Here, they're talking about what they think they know, but they haven't yet experienced it. It's only when they connect to the soul level connection that that starts growing here and they start experiencing things they've never experienced before. And one of those things, the primary one of those things, of course, is divine love entering the soul. Now, as the divine love enters the soul, they start experiencing the effects of that love, transforming their soul and their spirit form, and they start observing that it's real. And then they start seeing that, in fact, they're cre as a creature, they are being transformed into this divine thing that they thought was a different type of creature altogether. And in fact, in one of the pageant messages, one of the natural love spirits said, I know there are these divine love spirits, but they just fit through the spheres like, I don't know, maybe God doesn't think they're very important. And that's why they're allowed to go through these, boundaries, these interstellar boundaries. The truth is that these spirits are developed in love, in divine love, a different type of love than the other spirits are developed in, and that enables them to transcend those boundaries. So, is there somewhere that natural love spirits can talk to divine love spirits? They're obviously in the same sphere as they're seeing each other. Natural love spirits can talk to divine love spirits in any sphere. Right from the first sphere onwards. There are divine love spirits who are existing or helping spirits in any one of those locations. The way that it's activated is just by longing for it. So as soon as a spirit in the spirit world on the natural love path has a longing to understand the divine path, there are literally, like often there are hundreds of spirits surrounding them on the divine love path wanting to assist them. So all they have to do is have a longing for it. That's all. And that's the thing that's difficult for them because up till then, what they had to do is manufacture everything intellectually. Now all they have to do is have a desire and they'll manifest the people who will try, try, teach them. But often what happens is they have that desire and some body, body pops into their life, right, imagine, and he's all bright and he's all like, you know, happy and, and he's not very serious at all and he's quite joyful and, and he's enjoying himself. And what do they think? Oh. <laughs> this, this guy's a like, a, like this guy's a Jesus nutcase or something, right? Because he's talking about Jesus and God and all those things as well, right? And he's talking about the divine truths. And so, can you see how your emotional condition is going to affect you listening to that? So quite often, what happens? Many of these spirits, all the way through their progression, have these longings occur, and many times, straight away, a spirit appears that can assist them. But what happens inside of them is emotionally they can't accept that assistance. So humility and a willingness to empty a cup, so to speak, is one of the most important things. One of the most important things. And an ability to be able to accept anything coming to you as a method of you progressing. Yeah. What would you like? I was just going to say, because there are natural love spirits also assisting. Exactly. There's, there's natural love spirits also rushing to people's assistance, don't forget. So you see this Jesus happy guy pop along, right? And you see this natural love, really stoic sort of natural love spirit pop along. And you're a naturally stoic person, you know, who's very intellectual. Who are you going to listen to? 
and you'll listen to him again and again and again until he can't help you anymore. So, as a six-sphere spirit, what's the worst thing that could happen if you decide to investigate and go back to the third sphere? Nothing. Because you can always go back to the sixth sphere because you have the development in natural love to go back to that sphere if you want to. So what have they got to lose? Nothing. Why do you do uh, Because there's also a feeling of like lowering yourself in the process. So you've become so self-reliant that you believe you're God now. Many, in many cases you believe you're a fragment of God so you call yourself God, right? And so you get to that point where you become so self-reliant that you can't conceive that there's something that you must have missed out. So it's very important that spirits understand that process. Once they start understanding that process, they can actually begin progressing on the divine path. And when they progress on the divine path, they progress very rapid generally. So I've actually talked to spirits who have done this process, and within a few seconds of our time, they've gone from there to there to there to the celestial spheres. <coughs> Yeah, Ramford was one of those. So, our time, of course, is not their constraint. So they can assimilate huge amounts of information. They can actually work through huge amounts of emotion in a very short period if their desire is complete. So they can progress very, very rapidly. They must be curious then. Spirits in the sixth sphere must be curious because they're investigating things all the time. So if they could just be curious enough to try a different path... Yeah, that... But that, that question is motivated by your emotion. Because the reality is that many of them are not curious about the emotional side of things. They're very curious about the physical, the metaphysical, the spirit body, the spirit laws, and all those things. Very curious about all the things they know historically, but they are not curious about the soul stuff because it all sounds too much like, you know, honky, you love Jesus too much, you know, like that kind of thing. To them. <laughs> Do you get what I mean by that? <laughs> no, honestly, the biggest issue all of you are facing when it comes to coming to these sessions and telling your friends about it is what? The Jesus, the Jesus issue, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Well, it's the same for all of these spirits too, by the way. Like, they all have the same issue. Like, they, and if, particularly if they're on the on the natural love path, following maybe Buddha or some other some other really uh, wise teacher on earth who was, who was living on earth, they following that person, they, that occurs when they pass the spirit world, so they feel like they're still following that person. And then, you know, what, what has Christianity done to them on earth? Most of the time murdered them. Many, like historically, what were the Crusades and all of those, like, all of them were the murder of the so-called pagans, right? Now, that's their concept for many of them of Christianity. Sorry? Sorry. <laughs> so, the, the important thing to understand for them is it's just very, very difficult for them to face a lot of those questions. Karen? Can you? Oh, just wait for the mic, please. I thought of the sixth sphere, natural love spirits, wonder what happened to all the values that. Yeah, they all became honk if you love Jesus people. <laughs> what do you feel on earth when you feel a friend of yours becomes a born again Christian? What do you feel? And it's the same feeling for them. You see? Can you see that? It's the same feeling. You think they're gone nuts, right? And many times that's the feeling that these same spirits have. They've gone nuts, they've gone well, you know, look at them now, but they're like, they're like jumping around all the time, laughing about everything. We're very serious, we like being serious. And they're uh, very, you know, and so, so can you see straight away that there's a very different personality being shown? And, and, and because of the feeling inside the spirit who's in the sixth fear, there's a lot of judgment about that. And so they don't want to go on the path of uh, ground. The control is like it's like an addiction, and it's, it's from a from one perspective, it's like it's like a vicious cycle. It is, and you get so caught up in it, you can't see, you can't let go of it. That's it. Yeah, 
and you're experiencing that process now of letting go emotionally, and it's quite traumatic, isn't it? It's like, whoa, it's, like, it's very hard emotionally to let go, and it's a feeling Graham's been going through. Because when I first met Graham, what was it, 18 months ago now, or two years perhaps, you were very intellectual, very, connected, and now you're getting into your soul so much, but the letting go of the intellect, and the, this is this feeling that a spirit has, exactly the same feeling. And I, I feel like there's six fear stuff, and, and they just don't know what to do. They don't, yeah. They, they, they can't see outside the control. Exactly. And, and it's like, you just can't see it at all. Yeah. When you've become so self-reliant, you are now controlling your entire existence. So if you imagine in the sixth fear, you're in the sixth fear, you can control absolutely every single thing surrounding you. Through your law of attraction, it's very powerful, you're very much in the natural love space, you're in this loving space and moral, moral space, and you can control what you create so much. So you can go from, and, and I think uh, Lucinda described it in one of the channelings in the uh, some of you may have heard of, as a sideways shift. So you can you can go from this thing experimenting, this thing experimenting, that thing experimenting, this thing, that thing, and this thing, and that thing, thinking that you're progressing. But in reality, all you're doing is doing the same thing over again with a different subject. So what can they do? What they can do, what they need to do is start talking to the divine love spirits from a soul connection perspective. So what they need to start doing is allowing themselves to realize that there are things that they've missed about themselves. And what they've missed is this whole area of themselves called the soul. Not their mind, it's to do with their emotions, their passions and desires. And it's actually about connecting that with God and understanding that God is actually an entity. And I know for many six fear spirits that blows their mind. And if you think about it for yourselves, I mean, I've talked about God being an entity. Many of you feel like, how does that work? That how can that how can this huge universe with all these different dimensions be created by one being? How powerful is that being? How immense is that? And you're telling me this being can have a personal relationship with me? How crazy are you, like, right? Now, for a spirit, what they need to do is allow themselves to understand that one thing. That in the sixth sphere, they need to come to understand that God is a being with whom they can have a personal soul to soul connection, not an intellectual connection anymore, a soul to soul connection, which means developing their soul, developing themselves emotionally with a passion and desire for God. And all they need to do to experiment with it is to actually have the longing, to feel the longing in their soul and the divine love because of their condition will begin to flow into their soul. And in that process, they will be drawn back to the third sphere to investigate all of these soul truths that they missed out on because they weren't <coughs> interested in them at the time. Just in admitting that you don't know that long is in your heart, admitting that you thought you knew, but that you don't know. Yeah, it's a huge thing. And then there's something here that will help them to go forward. Yep. And as soon as they have that longing, their law of attraction will attract a spirit, usually in the divine path, who is in a higher development, who is very similar in their background, to them to help them through that progression. Uh, Karen, two things. The truth is that there are many questions like that that no person who is just developing intellectually will ever be able to be have an answer that will satisfy them. All right? So I can, you can give them an answer, but really the answer is I know at a soul level God is infinite and yet I know that I can connect to God and I know I'm a separate entity. Now how that works I don't know and in the end if you're in experiential mode, do you really need to know? So, so why does a person need to know that? 
there's only one emotion driving the need to know, and that is the fear. The need to know here is driven by the fear. And so he's afraid. He's afraid of letting go of a belief and actually taking on a new belief and the new belief not satisfying him. He would rather hold on to the old belief and keep that because it feels more satisfying to his intellect. So, you know, my answer to those kind of questions are until you open your soul, you will not be able to understand any of those kind of answers to these questions that you're asking intellectually. And by the way, that applies to all the six fear spirits who are listening here too. Until they actually open their soul and actually experience it personally, they will not know the answer. And, that, and that's the beauty of the divine love path. And that's why I said in the first century, if you seek first the kingdom, or what I actually said was, if you seek first God's love, all these other things will be added to you. So you see, it's only, and when I said all these other things, I didn't mean like physical things. or I mean everything. I meant all the knowledge of the universe is added to you as you receive divine love. Because there is so much knowledge in the universe that does that transcends the sixth sphere. That is much, much greater than the sixth sphere. Right? And, and if you are constrained by your intellect trying to understand, you will never, ever understand that knowledge. It's only when the soul perceptions, what, are, what I've called traditionally the soul perceptions, open up, and the soul perceptions includes your desires, your passions, your emotions, your intentions, and all those things in free will. Once those soul perceptions open up by the divine love entering you, then you're able to understand and begin to conceive what God is. Only then. Yeah. Okay. Ramtha's primary channel on earth was JZ Knight, a lady who appeared in the Down the Rabbit Hole movie and I think Secret. You know, The Secret, perhaps she was in too. I can't remember. Yeah, in the she was yeah, she's in The Secret, yeah. Um, now, she, she was challenging Ramtha, and Ramtha was on the natural love path. Ramtha um, obviously got, in, he's been in the spirit world for tens of thousands of years, I think about 45, 45,000 years. Um, and, and so he was obviously on the natural love path for a long time. And he uh, began focusing a lot of his intention on the earth. Uh, he had a deep desire to help people on earth. So what he did was he searched for a channel that he could use. And what he did is he found a channel, JZ Knight, who he could use. And he overcloaked her in such a manner that she could, you could see when he enters her and when he exits. So she started channeling all this truth that Ramtha had from the sixth sphere. And, uh, and as a process, she obviously becomes very, very linked with the spirit who is guiding her, right? Very, very linked. So the two of them become very linked. And, and Rantha is not like other six fear spirits who have completely overcloaked a person. So there are many uh, Indian gurus, for example, that a six fear spirit has completely overcloaked them. In their day to day life, they are the six fear spirit most of the time, right? But what JZ would do is she would ch channel Grantford and he would overcloak her for periods of time and uh, then she would channel and then he would exit. And she, you would see the differences in, in, in her as, as these transformations occurred. But in those channeling phases, she tra she's transmitted lots and lots of information from Grantford. Lots of uh, what you would classify as high metaphysical spiritual based information. Very intellectual. And all of the followers of Rantha are, are very, very focused on the development of the metaphysical gifts uh, the, and using the intellect rather than the emotion. Now that's been going on for many years. And then when, when Rantha actually, when I spoke with Rantha and he investigated the Divine Love Path, he moved on the Divine Love Path with his soulmate, by the way, very, very rapidly. Now, 
the problem with that is his channel, JZ Knight, is still on a natural love path, not receiving divine love. So can she now channel him as he is? Obviously, based on what I've been describing about the laws of report already, she can't. So what's happened is that Arantha began trying to channel to her more emotional material over a period of nearly one year. She became very emotional and quite sick during that process, JZ Knight, because she was very, very resistant to actually dealing with her emotions about it. And Ramtha then felt like he was just damaging her physically uh, by doing that. And so he steps back. Now in the process of stepping back, we've got a beautifully uh, prepared medium who's used to tra transmitting lots and lots of metaphysical information. And, uh, and he's there transmitting this metaphysical information and she's receiving it really well because she's really well developed in that regard. And so what happens now is another spirit who's in a similar state to what Rantha was has the ability to actually just step in. Who has a similar character and nature to him, of course, because otherwise she would feel the difference most probably. And so that's what actually happened. Uh, over a year ago now, yeah, she went through. Well, yeah, she went through a period of transition where she was feeling quite sick and ill, and not understanding it. Um, she actually cancelled some events uh, during this process, and didn't understand why she needed to. Well, she didn't understand for the first time in this whole process she was actually getting sick, and she didn't understand that either. And the reason why was because a, a celestial spirit will no longer maintain your physical body for you. So Celestial Spirit wants to teach you how to maintain your own body rather than use their energy to maintain your body. And so that causes a huge change in the person who's channeling. Now, I'm very certain that JZ Knight understands this has happened to her and that something is up. She understands something is different. But she also has some people surrounding her who, obviously, there's a, an enterprise now, um, very, very much focused on receiving messages from Ramtha. And when the problem, the problem with an enterprise is that it tends to gain its own momentum. And unless a person, the channel of herself, is in a very, very strong condition and not worried about the money or the ostracism that may result, um, and, and actually is willing to continue with the truth, she'll be very, very drawn into continuing it, convincing herself that she doesn't understand what just happened. And that's exactly what's going on at the moment. Um, just uh, microphone. Uh, Yeah, that's from the emotions. It has to be an emotional thing. It can't be an intellectual thing. That's it. That's it, yeah. The problem is dealing with the emotions that block it. See, see, all of you are having problems emotionally. All the problems and pain you're experiencing on this path are due to your resistance. We have huge resistances. All of my problems have been due to resistance. We have huge resistance on this path. That's why it becomes a, a difficult thing sometimes. The actual longing for divine love is very, very simple. But, as the divine love enters you, you get into a new condition, and then an emotion is treated, like unworthiness. Now I don't feel like I'm worthy to receive divine love. So, is my feelings now going to want divine love? Not you anymore. You remember to do it intellectually, but the feeling isn't there anymore because I feel unworthy and I have to deal with the unworthy feeling first. When I deal with the unworthy feeling, then I'll start receiving more divine love. Right? But to deal with the unworthy feeling, I've got to release it and experience it. And that's where we have our resistance. That's where the pain is. What about intellectually knowing that God loves us? Unworthiness doesn't become an issue then, isn't it? No, you can't do that. No. 
that's what a six-fear spirit would choose to do. They'll say, yes, of course you, God loves you. Of course you, you know, and they'll tell you all these lovely things, but unless you personally feel it inside of you, you will not believe it. So I can tell you I love you, but you won't believe it until you feel it inside of you. And you could have lots and lots of blocks to feeling that inside of you. Does that make sense? And it's the release of the blockages that creates the pain and the suffering. It's the error going out that is painful, not the love coming in. <laughs> you follow me? And that applies to these spirits on these paths, all of the spirits in the spirit world too. It's the error going out that's the painful operation. The love coming in is a beautiful experience. The error going out is a very traumatic experience. That's why error is so damaging. If we could get rid of all the error, we'd just have these beautiful experiences experiencing the my love. But that's what's going on for us here on Earth. All right, now getting back to our discussion then. Can you see what's happening for these spirits? Can you see now, we're talking about the laws of rapport and communication. Can you see, as this spirit changes its own soul condition and its own belief structure, can you see it's going to automatically feel attracted to different people on Earth? Right? Because of its changes in belief structure and soul condition and so forth. So a spirit in the first fear, in you know, the beginning of his progress, if he has an anger with women emotion, he's going to be attracted to two types of people most probably. He's going to be attracted to a man who is anger with women, or he'll be attracted to a woman who he can be angry with. Right? And he'll work through that emotion slowly if he's on the natural love path. might take him 10 years. might take him a lot longer, by the way. might take him 10 years. And then he gets to his back. I'm not angry with women anymore. Oh, I just want to help this woman that I've been hassling for the last 10 years. Right? So he will change in his attitude towards her. And then, it, oh, she's pretty angry with men, actually. I don't know if I want to hang around her now. So he'll go off and find another person, perhaps, and then work through another emotion. And eventually he'll come to the spirit world and stay in the spirit world and work through emotions through the interactions with other spirit beings, spirit persons. Now as he's doing that, his soul condition is changing. Now if I'm a medium, I can talk to him this week, and if his soul condition is changing very rapidly on the divine love path, he's going to feel like almost a totally different person next week when I talk to him. And can you see for a JZ night how confusing that would be? You've been connecting with the spirit for 30 years, a certain type of person, a certain type of entity, a certain type of feeling, a certain type of projection. Ramp through a very, very powerful spirit, so lots of power being projected through her. And then all of a sudden he backs off with the power. Man, you're going to think, whoa. Whoa, like, this is a different person. Something's wrong here. I'm not connecting with Ramtha anymore. But it might be Ramtha, but he's just progressed to a new level of divine love which won't harm a person's free will and is much more gentle and straight away you feel that the person's got a different personality. So can you see how, if you're here on Earth, speaking with spirits, how you need to be sensitive to the emotional condition and the emotional changes in you. The reason why is because they're so absorbed by their own life and that like, the Earth life feels like, like childhood or even nursery. And the sixth fear, sixth fear feels like adult, right? So would you go back to your child? No, it's very rare for you to do it. But there is one thing that draws them to you, and that is your desire. So, for instance, you can have a feeling or a, a longing to speak with a certain spirit. That spirit will feel it. A sixth fear spirit will get a message appear on their inbox, if you like. Does that make sense? And they'll know that you just sent them that message. They'll know where it came from. And whether they respond to you or not will totally depend upon their desire. Now, a divine love spirit will often respond because a divine love spirit is very interested in actually talking to people on Earth and helping people on Earth progress. So, like, uh, James has had, had a longing, for example, uh, for Gandhi to come. And the instant he had a longing for Gandhi to come, Gandhi popped in. And you had a short discussion with Gandhi. Yeah. And then uh, Gandhi left. James has, a, uh, James has had a long-term guide, 
you know St. Francis of Assisi? Yes. Well, that, that's James Guy. Now, St. Francis doesn't call himself St. Francis anymore. He just calls himself Francis. And he doesn't even call himself that in the spirit world anymore. But it's just for James' uh, benefit. But Francis actually influenced James before he got onto the divine love path to actually go to Italy and visit the locations. And James had these feelings when he was in the city. Right? which were confirmational feelings from his guide. Right? And this was before James actually went on to the divine love path. So these guides are often constantly influencing you. And it's only when they're a guide generally, if they're on a natural love or divine love path, that they're surrounding you on earth. Most of the spirits in the spirit world in the natural love path and the sixth fear never visit the earth anymore. And in fact, many spirits on the divine love path in the divine love spheres never visit the earth anymore. They visit other spheres where they have different feelings and they have different things that they're helping and different jobs that they do and so forth. So, so not all of these spirits come to earth, but your longing draws them. So when you long for an old, you know, if you think about an old relative who's passed, it's highly likely if that relative is in a lower sphere that they'll pop in and say hello. Now, if you're a medium, you can start having a chat with them. How are you doing, mate? Oh, yeah, I'm going okay, he'll say. And then say, but how are you really doing? Oh, well, to tell you the truth, you know, it's a bit like our conversations here on Earth, isn't it, in a way? You know, you say, how are you going, mate? Oh, I'm great, I'm great, thanks, mate. Yeah, I'm great. And, and off you go. And then you realise, gee, am I really great? Probably not, actually. I feel a bit, when I think about it, my relationship with my wife isn't doing that good. My son doesn't talk to me anymore. My, you know what I mean? And you start listing off these things. But to the person who just asked you, you say, you're great, right? And this continues often all the way through the spirit world. So you've got these spirits coming to you saying they're great. But in reality, they're in quite a lot of emotional pain. But they don't tell you about that pain because they don't want to talk about their emotions because they learned how to not do that on earth. Right? How to not talk about their emotions. And so many times when a spirit comes to you, if, if, if their spirit's in a degree of pain, they will not tell you the truth about their own emotional condition. So that's pretty interesting to bear in mind, isn't it? So they come to you and say, oh, yeah, great, yeah. No, oh, by the way, two days' time, you're going to lose your keys and you're going to find them at such and such place. Oh, no worries. <laughs> you know, and then two days' time,